Springbok legend and former front rower Oli LaRue is our guest on Front Row Rugby today. Oli, a warm welcome to you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Good to chat to you. Long time ago and far away over the seas, I believe. So, yeah, it's nice uh, catching up with the old guys from the old days. The pleasure is all mine. Let's take a look at today's trivia question. Who did the Springboks face in their opening match of the 2003 Rugby World Cup? If you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. We'll also find out if Oli knows the answer to the question, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Oli, I'd like to start. In 1994, when you made your debut for the Springboks against England at Loftus, how excited were you for that moment? Yeah, you know, any, uh, I think when you're that young and you're in that game, it's, it's, it's something totally new. I got into that big world. And, uh, and uh, it's something it's hard to describe. It's, it's unreal feeling because you're not you're there but you're not really sure what the hell you're doing there because you've got to find your feet at that level and, and what's interesting is uh, I believe many really really good Springboks started very very young if you look at some of the guys that started as, as 20 year old 21 year olds but they only became good Springboks at 26 27 because you grow into that role at an international level and uh, I remember that yeah it was amazing I was still sharing a, a room with US and those days you had all the people it was uh, it was really like we were still amateurs, you know, very few people realized we were actually amateurs. We were only allowed to get together the Tuesday before, uh, the, th the Wednesday before a game. So we had very um, um, scallum practices uh, where we had to, we had got the forge together just to get us scrumming together. So you were always set up to lose your first test in a way because you couldn't really practice together. And then, uh, uh, so we didn't have a lot of time together. We had a couple of guys that um, they were we were picked by selectors, and 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 one or two of the guys uh, hit up a couple of injuries. And the English were tougher because they come on tour. They lost to us in Bloemfontein in the Free Staters. They lost a lot to some of the provincial sides. And when people lose, uh, especially international sides, they become a really good rugby side because you only get better by playing together, you know. And when we pitched up on that day, yeah, we were exceptional, talented players, and and, and we. Were, we're, but unfortunately, we weren't a good team, and and to make a good team in a short space of time is very very difficult. And uh, I think Rob had a great game that day, kicked a couple of drop goals. We were chasing it, and uh, yeah, it, it wasn't the best debut I had. And uh, funny enough, the first time I ever got dropped out of the team was out of the test match. Uh, uh, that game that I got dropped after. So it was emotionally, it was a tough time for me. And uh, yeah, but it's life and it, it uh, just makes you stronger. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? As you say, you got dropped from the team after that test and didn't play again for the Springboks until 1998. Why did it take so long? Yeah, I was a bit unlucky in the 95 World Cup. I was on the bench for the test against Samoa and, and I was unlucky to miss that, uh, the 1995 World Cup. And then a guy like Kitch and myself, we, Kitch, Kitch saw Afrikaners as stupid people. And unfortunately, uh, you know, he likes oak, you fit in the box, you like, they call us, uh, what do they call us, those days, rock spiders or whatever. It was a big thing between, uh, you know, in those days, we had a lot of uh, racism issues and classism issues, and we had English and Afrikaans against each other, and Jewish oaks against this, and you know, and, and I just think um, I just didn't. I was a bit of an outspoken individual that, that did stuff that freaked people out because props weren't supposed to do certain stuff that I did, and I was young, so you're always looking for a bit more experience. But when it came on the field, I was always performing above people, and I think uh, you know, Kitsch, I was. It was difficult to to for me and him didn't see eye to eye. And after him, in 1996, few people know it. I made the the, the squad going to the Tri Nations. I was. I was there with Andre Markroff and uh, funny enough, he was the, the, the one of the first coaches that Kitch also told me, you know, you're the best rugby player out there, but there's question marks about your aggression and because I played, I ran around the field too much, you know, they, they, they didn't understand how to coach that. And uh, then I got a stress fracture. So I was in 96 with the Tri-Nation squad. Everything got a stress fracture, just didn't make it. I only came back at the end of the year, played in the, in the SA8 team. And that SA8 team included guys that played serious Springbok games. In 1997, uh, I started off, uh, I made a bit of uh, other mistakes and, 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 and also struggled to, to really get into the team. But the end of that year, I got uh, talks went over and he made that. Uh, unfortunately, he, he had a bad year that year. He had a couple of uh, problems that he uh, talks for. And he, he caused a bit of trouble and he still rocked the one guy in the face. So I came over. But what people don't realize in those days, you had 30 guys, you had the team manager, you had the, the coach, you had the assistant coach and the physio and the doctor. Okay, it's much smaller squads. So I arrived and, and, and the next minute, um, 
I actually had a bit of a blinder playing against the students. And uh, I think I, I was on for 10 minutes and I ran through half the team and we scored two tries from my playing. And Nick Mallet said, geez, like, how the hell did we leave this guy at home? <laughs> it was me after 10 minutes. I was tired because I was in preseason training. And uh, and after that, they actually they had guys on the, uh, uh, ready for tour to come over to play. Uh, and then in 1998, I had a very, very good season with the Sharks. Uh, and then from there, we just, uh, I fought myself back. So I was never out of contention. I just, it was just that 50-50 call. Things just didn't go my way, you know. And then from 1998, I played all the way through to 2002. Probably would have made 2003 as well, but me and Rule Australia had a bit of a, a, a personality disagreement. And, uh, and and that's unfortunate, you know, if you just look at how the guys, two players today are rushing them, and, and they actually look at, at managing players better and, and, and how the environment has changed. And I think that's from the amateur era. The amateur era was very different from the professional era. People don't understand. And have a look at the guys that are really doing well. They played in the amateur era. They understand what the game was about in those days. The professional era has changed a lot of the rugby, but the ethos, the core of the game is still the same. Oli, you touched on playing for the Sharks in 1998, and the purpose of this channel is to talk specifically about Springbok careers, but I want to deviate for this one, because it was a Super 12 match against the Hurricanes in New Zealand, and I can't remember who it was had scored a try, and the ball had been lined up either on the kicking tee or the sand at the time, and for whatever reason, Henry Honeyball was nowhere near the ball, Andre Hubert was nowhere near the ball, but you were standing over the ball, and you just took the conversion and and remarkably the ball was actually tumbling over at that moment and of course you slotted the conversion it was one of the most extraordinary moments in rugby that was a very interesting if you played in a place called palmerston north now that's like really like Valcom with a racetrack, you know what I'm saying? It's really a bit of a dodgy place and the wind was blowing from right to left. So in New Zealand, it's very important which way you play because against the wind in the second half, puts you in a lot of pressure. We were playing with the wind in the second half. So we were doing well, winning, going, getting ahead. And, uh, and, and we still scored a really good try. I think uh, Peter Miller scored the try and we had a big thing in those days. Maxi, just guys, the Oaks are scoring tries and nobody even goes and congratulates you. So I ran up to Peter and said, congratulations, well done. And as, as he, he threw the ball and I looked, I saw the ball and I went to pick it up and to go give it to Henry Honeyball to kick. So as I'm walking to the kicking, there's nobody there. So I'm looking. So the next minute, if you look at the video clip, you'll see Henry Honeyball and they're doing something on his shoulder. But Andre Joubert is right at fullback. So he's like all the way back. And I'm screaming, hey, somebody must kick. Somebody must kick. Mm -hmm. And the next minute, the referee, I think it was Ian... Roberts, he was, oh, he's, he's died now. Yes, but, and he looked at me, he says, hey, your time's running out, you got to kick. I said, are you being serious? He says, yeah, so the guy with the tee was there, we only have a minute and a half to kick anyway. So I placed the ball and I can kick, don't worry about it. Then I placed the ball in the next minute, um, Andre Joubert came running, I said, hey, Andre's coming. He says, no, you don't have time, you got to kick. I said, you're being sure? He says, yeah. I said, okay, well, let's kick. And as I went to kick, the ball fell over and I realized, yes, we're just going to keep your head down and follow through. And I actually missed it way left, but because it was like a bit of a torpedo kick, it came back over the, and I actually <laughs> scored the two points. But people don't know, Ian McIntosh had a full go at me afterwards saying, how arrogant can you be to do this kick? And look at it, after that, we didn't score another point and they actually came back and scored, uh, came back in the game and he blamed me for that because that stuff wasn't done. It was seen as arrogant towards your opponents. You know, meanwhile, me, nobody knew there was nobody to kick. What do we have to do? They not kick. You know what I'm saying? No? So it was a bit of a conundrum, but it was a part of, uh, if, even to this day, if you look at it, it's quite impressive. <laughs> I think it remains one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in rugby. So, Ali, in 1998, um, the Springboks were in the midst of a 17-match unbeaten run. That win over the All Blacks in Durban uh, from 23-5 down with about 12 or so minutes to go, was that the highlight? Well, that was an amazing season, you know, and, and what was amazing, um, um, what people don't know, uh, uh, Nick Mallet in 1897, he took over from, I was just, he took over from Andre Markrov, okay? Yeah, because Andre Markrov, unfortunately, got recorded and, and, and he said a some very bad things, you know, and uh, and unfortunately, and then they had problems. Who did they pick? But Nick Mallet went on the, at 97 to, and the players really enjoyed Nick because he was an outspoken guy that you could actually give an opinion to. Where, you know, if you give an opinion to Andre Markov, it looks to you and say, Bow back, with you blame you. But now you had a guy like Nick Mallet that you could bring. And Nick Mallet went and he approached, if I'm correct, and, and you can verify this, he went to the Sharks and he spoke to, uh, 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 if I'm not mistaken, James Small. 
Mark Andrews, Andre Joubert, Gary Teichman, Henry Honeyball. He went to the Stormers. He spoke to, I don't know who mm-hmm. the Stormers guys were those days. He went to the Lions and he spoke to the cool guys, James Dalton, Grano Otto, with Juice at the Bulls, Andre Snyman, cool guys that was part of his group, the leadership team. And he said, guys, I want to pick you guys and I'm going to back you, okay? And I want to take this to your phone. So suddenly there was a coach that actually told guys, I'm going to pick you and I'm going to back you, okay? The next one at this created a massive, uh, um, you know, he brought in Solly, which uh, from the, the Stormers, uh, that that was a bit of a double-edged sword, unfortunately. Um, and uh, uh, that's another story, but we'll get there later. And then he started just getting on the team. And, and what I found is if you tell players, if you look what Rosie does, this is your job, that's what I want to do. And they start believing in you. And you don't criticize them until you utterly have their respect. But what you're saying is for the better of the team, you just start jelling. And, and he went on that tour and the guys started jelling. It was strong, strong characters. You know, James Small, James Dalton, Mark Andrews, geez, like, bro. Then you had Osti Runt, you had, uh, you had uh, Jus van der Vestes, and you had, uh, there was really some strong players as well. And, and getting them to commit and believe, he got a lot of momentum in the end of the year tour. Uh, and, and it was also a bit of momentum that he built on Andre Markov. Carl Duplessis was the next guy. Carl also built on it, but he just couldn't, he just had a, it sounds funny and it's going to, people are going to crucify me, but, but a bit of that, that Africana, are you back and do not you see, and, and, and rugby's evolved to a place where, okay, guys, we've got to think now, how do we, we're playing seven phases, eight phases now, we've got interaction, guys are playing rugby now, when the old days was shut up and scrum, shut up and do lineouts and do that, the basics still were there, but suddenly the game evolved, and if you have players input in their body and it's very powerful, so he created that, yeah, that year, we uh, as the Sharks, we really played good rugby. We had Chris Rousseau being there, myself, Robbie Kempson, Adrian Garvey, and everybody's going at this bomb squad thing, and I just laugh at it. You know, the first guy that used the bomb squad was Ian McIntosh. He had a problem. He had Oliver, Adrian Garvey, and, and Robbie Kempson. And if we didn't play, we were the most difficult acts in the field. So he said, I'm going to give you equal time on the field so you guys can play rugby. But it put it, and, and he started using us the correct way. From there, uh, we went in 98. I started the first couple of tests. I really had a good season. And Nick Mallet came to me and says, Ollie, you're my best player, but I need you in the last 40. So I'm going to put Robbie Kempson on, let him do the first 40, and you come on in the last 40. And we started doing that. And it really worked for him. My, 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 the type of player I am, the intensity that I... And we started, but what was amazing, you know, we brought in Bobby Skinstad for that tri-nation. That was really, really good. A phenomenal rugby player. He had Van Swanepoel on the bench. He had me. He had a guy like Franco Smith. And these are rugby players, guys that can play, you know. And, uh, and, and when we came on, we had Tuesday practice sessions, but you don't understand. It was physical. We had to wear suits and we were like cannon for the, for the test side. So we actually had a match for 20 minutes on Tuesdays, full on against the test side. So we as reserves grew into this uh, uh, playing hard rugby and then we would get five minutes at the end to test the defense. We would go A-all, you know, and, and, and that created this incredible environment for that team to play. And But what was amazing... The one game there that we we, we beat, the, um, we had the games against the Irish and then we had that massive scores against uh, uh, Wales that brought that second tier team. I think we gave them 100 but, and we didn't even worry about it. The next game that we played was uh, uh, um, the Australians over there. And the Australians, we beat them 18-15. It was a close game, but we were in control of the game. So what Nick then did, and we was brilliant, he'd analyze the game and he'd show you the rhythm in the game and where we'd lose the, ris- the rhythm. And he would be very direct with you. That was wrong. He would say, uh, uh, one game, Adrian Garvey got the ball and he ran out the sideline. And, and Nick Mallet, but you must understand, with Nick Mallet, we had a full go at you. This is YouTube, so I can't really say, but it was like, it wasn't like, yes, listen, yeah, you didn't play well. It was like, you Peep, 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 idiot, you peep, 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 see that line, you go inside. So he coached you on the video. And it was so nice to have a visual coach to see what he wanted because then you could actually just to hear it. But you see, that was wrong. Do it this way. The next video session, you would do it. He'd say, stop, rewind. Look at that. And then Garvey listened. He hit the five yards and he came inside. He didn't run out. Well done, you know. So he's very good at that. And the next minute, um, we played that game in Athletic Park. And that was amazing. We were there on the Thursday. On the bus, Henry Honeyball looked at the guys. said, guys, I'm telling you, I've got a move that's going to work. And uh, and we said, how? Oh, they walked it through. Okay, we go, dummy US, and then pop, uh, 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 um, what's his name? And he blocked uh, Josh Kronfeld. And we defended for 60 minutes in that game. But like you don't understand, with Andre... 
It was incredible. We just defended, defended. All Blacks played so much rugby and then we scored that one try. And that's where we started really believing because beating the All Blacks in Athletic Park, that is something different level. And uh, the last time that happened, I believe, was in uh, 1981 when the guys were staying in squash courts. Okay. But it's interesting. Remember the guys stayed in squash courts in 1981. It's not really different from guys being in a bio bubble in, 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 in COVID. Eh? So, so the Springboks of 1981 was a really good team. They had the same struggles as the Springboks now and they all live together in closed environments. Just an interesting thing to, to look at. And then we came back to South Africa and we really believed this was it. But that game in Durban was incredible. We scored an early try through Stefan de Blanche looking good and the next minute they just got momentum like you don't understand. And funny enough, when he sent me on, it was simple. We had a job to go do. He sent me on. Bobby came on and, uh, and, and, and Franco came on and the next minute the game just broke open. We scored those two nice drives and, uh, and, and we won the game going away. And then the next game against the Australians, that was the big one for us because they, they were a tough side and, and, and we had to tomorrow and the guys were playing. But just with our defense coming off the line really hard and we won that one going away. And, and we created a lot of belief then. We would have gone, I believe we would have gone 18 games in a row. Okay. But then Nick Mallet made the biggest mistake of his whole career. Okay. He had the team and, 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 and when we went overseas and Bobby was playing some serious good rugby, he's a flipping amazing rugby player, probably one of the best five in his position uh, uh, when he wasn't injured that because uh, he just had everything. But they pushed him really hard to become the next captain. You know, they were pushing, as Solly was pushing this guy, like you don't understand, the Stormers were great. I think they won the, the, the Curry Cup. So they, they, whoever won the Curry Cup at the end of the year tour was a bit, um, and Solly was pushing hard. And the next minute they said, now we're going to drop Andre Fint and play Bobby Skinstead because we have to have him on the team. When he did that, he lost the change room because nobody ever trusted him. Bobby Skinstead place was not in the team. His place was from the bench to come and make us, and, and, and that was his place at that stage. The fact that he would have been on the, if he was on the bench in the next World, we would have won the next World Cup without a doubt. But this became such a big issue. That's where Gary Teichman got shot. And the Solly was 100% directly involved in that. It's actually so sad. One of the worst decisions ever that cost us. But then another thing that backfired on Nick in that game, we won the first game and yeah, Bobby was playing well and we had a, a good game against Scotland, beating them going away. And then our last game was against England and England was a tough side. You know, people don't understand internationally at Twickenham, yeah, they're, they're really a tough side. And you've come at the long year, end of the long year, the guys are tired. Uh, what people don't know, in those days, we played midweek games as well. So we had 30 guys, okay? You had the 15 and the 15, and then the reserves would actually be fitting in on the... So I played on that too, I played eight games. You played the midweek game, you played the... And you play your 30, 40 minutes. And uh, the next minute for the last game, uh, they picked a Solly... Uh, uh, they picked the Christian Stewart at 10 instead of Franco Smith. And there, the whole change room, the, Nick Mallet lost the change room there because Frank Smith was the next guy in line. He's been performing the whole season. The same with Andre Fenter. They didn't underperform. They were performing at a very high level. We were winning. And suddenly, he changed the whole dynamics of the team. And he never had the, I don't know if it's the wisdom or the, or the intelligence. He's a very intelligent guy. But he didn't have the, have the feeling of what he was doing to the team as soon as he did that. Uh, and I still remember the one game, nothing against Christian Stewart, great player, good fun guy to, to draw with. But he was never the athlete that a guy like Franco was. It was Franco's time. It was his time. If he had played that game, I still remember we took a gap at one stage and Christian was running and I was jogging next to him. He was just a bit too old and too slow for that level of rugby, you know. And, and, and if it was Franco Smith, we would have won that game. and We would have had our 18 games in a row. And, and the sad part is that's where a coach through making stupid decisions by having a stupid guy in his ear telling him, do this, do this, um, uh, that it actually cost us something that I believe we, we, we could have been a great destined to do and put a lot of pressure on us then because then a guy like Gary was under pressure and, and it just became something that, that actually cost us the next, uh, a really good result in the next World Cup. Ali, I think you've answered several of my follow-up questions there regarding Alan Solomon's The End of the Nick Mallet Era. So let's move on then to 2000. Mallet is replaced by Harry Phil Yoon. And I know that you have some stories to share as well about the Phil Yoon era. Yeah, what was very interesting, Harry came on board. Wow. <laughs> you know, he went from Andre Marklo to and Carl Duplessis to Nick Mallet. You know, now you're back at Harry again. So it's a whole new world for us. But I want to tell you an interesting story before we go from a guy called James Small. And I, I believe I have the right to tell the story. 
James Small got called in by Andre Markraft. We played in 20, I must just get my, uh, 1996, we played a game against the Lions, the Sharks. We were quite far behind, 19-3. We beat them going away. Uh, James Small caused a lot of trouble in the game because he was swearing out under the belt and he was causing a lot of trouble with Henny LaRue and with Yopi Milner, but it was like crazy. And they were targeting him and he was getting them to lose focus off the game. He still got rucked in his hand. I remember he sat there with ice on his hand because the guys were going for him, but it just it was a bit of gamesmanship from James, you know. And uh, the next minute in the report, Henny LaRue said you know, he, was, he refuses to play him, that they won't play with James Small, with the Transvaal guys or whatever. So uh, they had a big core of the World Cup guys. So they were very strong, but unfortunately, they lost at that because there were many other guys coming in. So we're sitting in the hotel, and the next minute, James Small's phone rings, and, and Andre Markcroft calls him in. So now we're all sitting there waiting to hear what happens. Uh, the next minute, he comes back, and he says, hey, James, what have been wrong? He said, oh, you know, the usual told me this, that. And he said, you know what, James, I've got your career in the small of my hand. I can make it or I can break it, you know. And I said, yeah, I know I understand it, but you know, you're the fourth coach that said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what very few people understand. You know, your yeah, coaches can make or break your career, but at the end of the day, the players make or break a coach's career, okay? And, uh, and, and, and Harry Fulhune came on, and yes, and Harry had an incredible view of what he wanted to do, okay? And very, Harry had, uh, he was way ahead of his time. I really believe today, he would actually not be. He would actually be able to do very, very well. Uh, uh, but at Springbok level, it's tough because it, there's other dynamics at play, and, and there's a lot of energies. You've got provincialism, you've got uh, 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 classism, you've got uh, Afrikaans, English. There's a lot of dynamics that has to fit into each other. You know, I prefer scrumming with Chris so Now I've got to scrum with John Smith. You know, and and and, and so, so it's a, you've got to find each other. And Harry came in simple business terms. We're going to be the best team in the world. We're going to look like the best. We're going to pay you like you're the best. And you're going to play like you're the best. I'm going to get the best in every position to coach you and make sure. So yeah, he brought guys in of, of, from all over. He brought the heart trade guys in to look at our, our conditioning. He brought the, the, the kickers from the Aussie rules in. He brought Tim Lane in, which at that stage was with the, uh, the Wallabies, one of the best backline coaches. Andre Markcraft, that's got a pedigree of note with the Springbok for, as forwards coach. You know, and he just got these guys together, but unfortunately, he didn't understand egos. <laughs> Whoa, to manage that amount of egos was a bit of a shit show. So, uh, and I think Harry didn't realize it. And then um, the one guy I had there as well was Mark Hain. And Mark Hain was always a bit of a gray area for us because he was on one side, he was with the papers, but on the other side, suddenly he's a team lies. And I think Harry brought him in to take his, because he was, he could literally have some poison stuff that he said about teams to bring him into our teams. But he also brought him in as a bit of a spin doctor. And, and, and it was like, we don't, we, you know, it, it didn't fit in, in. We don't need a spin doctor. We're normal guys playing the game as hard as we can. You know, if you just look at Rossi and them, this champions thing, hey, boys, what are we going to fuck them up? I can't say that nicely. That's what we're going to do. Okay, let's do it. You know, and, 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 and that dynamics, because a lot of people were nervous, you know, so, so he brought this massive team in. We trained in my life. We never trained like that. We had one day, I remember Andre Fente was in, I was my roommate. He said, oh, you, you can't train like this. And Andre Fente can train, trust me, okay? He just said, you can't train like this. We were overextended ourselves. And the whole, but then we started playing, things going better right here. And the end of the year tour, and this is where Harry Mussolini made his biggest mistake. We were playing Argentina. And he said, if we say we're the best team in the world, we're going to be the best at ball retention, best at everything, we're not going to kick. We're going to play a test match without kicking a single ball in a whole test match. So we say, okay, but Harry, if you're on the five yards line, can we kick? He says, no. We'll keep the ball and we're going to play. So the first of the poor Pumas, are, <laughs> we're running them ragged. They're so tired. Yeah, we as well, but we're right. We're going. The second half, they say, guys, they're not kicking. So they just put 15 guys in the front line. Naively, that's when we should say, okay, guys, when they do that, realize we should have had a strategy around that, okay? But we were going, and, and I still remember Andre Marco was sitting next to him, and I was sitting behind. I was, I think I was on the bench, and I was quite sick. Uh, and uh, he was sitting there, and, and he was saying, Harry, we have to kick. Harry, we have to kick. And Harry said, we're not going to kick. We're not going to kick. We have to keep it. Now we're five yards from our trial line for 15 minutes, and it's just like this bashing, and they just got us blocked, and we're not getting out. And on 72 minutes, uh, uh, Harry just said, Okay, okay, let's kick. And as he said it, he lost. Everybody realized he didn't believe what he said, and he lost the whole change room there. From there, he just never, ever managed to get the guys back. Because if we had gone that game with what he had said, I truly believe 
that side would have been unstoppable because we just, you know what, it's like we just believe you, coach. What are we going to do? We're going to do that? Let's do it. And that's just the South African way. Look what Rossi did. Simple. That's what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. We believe you. Let's do it. You know, every now and then a result goes good, but we're just going to keep on doing it. And, and that's where Harry, unfortunately, had a, had a, a, a he lost the change room. And then the, the stress that came, you know, I believe the Springbok coach, how people, uh, you know, his family and personal stress just broke him. And he just said, listen, you guys, I don't want to take this anymore. And he then actually uh, stepped aside, which allowed uh, Jake White to come in and, and do very, very well, you know, with, with, with the side that, 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 that ended up winning a World Cup. Ali, you mentioned earlier that there was something that happened between you and Rudolf Strauli uh, that prevented you from going to the 2003 Rugby World Cup. What happened there? No, Rudolf Strauli was a very sad story. We went to the Sharks, came there uh, in, a, in a tough time when we had a transition with Kevin Putt and with uh, Iris Edwards. Started really doing well with the guys. Um, um, it was exactly in that time when we knew Harry and them went there. And, and we got him to the Super 12 final, you know. And at the end of the day, he also did the cup, made a lot of mistakes there. We were going well and, and he changed sides and trying to be too smart. And uh, we, we lost that final against the Brumbies. And I really believe we were a team that could have won it. But uh, you know what? Uh, finals are tough, especially overseas. But what Rulof then did, as soon as he got picked for the box, he totally showed his disloyalty towards the guys that got him there. And he suddenly went full on blue bull and he went and he just backed the blue bulls. He didn't back the Sharks guys that got him there. And, and that was very, it was like a traitor. He, tra- he, he, he was a traitor to us, you know, because we were the team that got him there. The next minute, he just picked all these blue bull guys. He had a guy like Rudy, I don't even know Rudy, the, the, the backline coach, Rudy, uh, I forgot his surname. And they just didn't come in. And, and Ian, no matter who you are, Kitch Christie, you always pick the guys that get you there and, and fill in the gaps with the other tip type of players. But, and, and I saw Rule Australia after we were with him at the Springboks and he did a, a lot of stuff and, 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 and we still played a game. It was such a shocking game because you, you try to play an expansive game against the Blue Bulls. And, and, and I saw him, hey, the Rule of Fouls guy, and said, yeah, that was great rugby, but it was such. But you said to us, you want to play an expansive game, but yeah, you're playing this stupid rugby. It didn't make sense. And, and, and he became a really. Um, you know, uh, at one stage I realized I wasn't going to make the side. They picked a the guy ahead of me that I don't even think people, you know, was never even close to to, to being an international player for the Spring, Spring Bucks. And they didn't pick a guy like Mark Andrews. I think Bobby Skinstead got shot, luckily, because I think we would have been guys that would have said, come start rods, bullshit, we don't like that stuff. And uh, the next minute, um, he, he really just changed the, his, his behavior towards us. We This is a guy that you would... That you would have uh, died for, and the next minute he was this this loyal guy, and and, and unfortunately it, it it didn't end well for Rolf. You know he, he wasn't a good coach, and I made a comment in the one newspaper. You should rather stop playing now or stop coaching now because we'll never win the World Cup with him. And I got a I got a, a, a message through channels that now he's going to hunt me down. I said, what's he going to do? Take away my birthday, you know? Because he, and the coach had so much power over your life that the arrogance to say something like that to a person was actually disgusting. And, and then I still remember Mike still sent him some golf clubs to me, and I, and, he, and the secretary phoned to come pick it up. I said, no, it's fine. Tell him to come pick it up. I'm waiting here because I heard he wants to. Hear. This is my address. He never came and picked him up. So that was really sad, you know, because we had a very special thing going with the Sharks. He did really well. And then and, and a coach becomes like a father figure to you. And the betrayal that, that was there, it was something that wasn't, it's not something that, uh, uh, it, it hurts, it hurts. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Ollie, thank you so much for sharing that. And just before we finish up, let's take a look at the trivia question again. Who did the Springboks face in their opening match of the 2003 Rugby World Cup? Oli, do you know the answer? I think I do. I think I do. But uh, am I allowed to say it? <laughs> this is your moment. It, 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 was, it was England. We played Please. England in the first match. Or the Ollie. All Blacks. We played England, but that was actually our second pool match. Yeah. Second so, match. Second match. Second match. Know, was, Samoa. was it Samoa? So the correct answer is Uruguay. Uruguay. Yeah, I wouldn't have got that one. <laughs> I thought it was English match. Yeah, I still remember that Samoa. Put Derek Oakland with Hamlet in that one. <laughs> Oli, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure having you on Front Row Rugby today. And I think we only just scratched the surface with some of those stories. So I think we're going to have to have you back on here again in the future. Anytime you're available, yeah, because there's some nice stories I can tell you about Rossi and uh, the rest of the guys. You know, it's uh, it's amazing to watch what they do. And uh, and, and I believe Springbok Rugby is something that, that South Africa and the world needs because it just shows you 
people working together with a common goal, with not too much wings and uh, bells and whistles, can can make a positive change in, in in the world, especially in South Africa. Thanks for your time. Last time on Front Row Rugby, 1995 Rugby World Cup winner James Dalton was here. You can go and have a look at that video. It's appearing on the screen right now. Next time, we'll have another 95 Rugby World Cup winner with us, Kurbis Visa. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.